her and many of her peers. I really wouldn't want to work in those conditions where, you know, I would feel that my science was being stifled. Gibbs heads up a group called Evidence for Democracy. Last summer, they protested what they call the muzzling of federal scientists and the closure of research facilities like the Experimental Lakes area. They say they are scientists who are speaking out for those who can't. No science, no evidence. Now Canada's Information Commissioner, Suzanne Legault, says she will investigate the ongoing complaints of muzzling. Democracy Watch is one of the organizations that appealed to Legault. And the public pays for this research and the public has a right to know it. Critics say some topics are particularly sensitive to the government. Climate change, greenhouse gas emissions and how it relates to oil sands development. There is a war on science and scientists in this country. At an international polar conference last year in Montreal, government handlers shadowed Canadian scientists, monitoring their every word. The chill that we're experiencing here in Canada is now spilling out over our borders and affecting uh, how scientists around the world look at Canada. Some Canadian scientists point out the Obama administration has directed science agencies to make their research available to the public. They have a policy that allows their scientists to speak freely with the media on scientific issues. But the government insists no censorship is happening here and that scientists get to speak frequently. I'm optimistic that this, this uh, inquiry will, will prove what we've been saying all along, which is that uh, scientists do have uh, uh, access to media and to the public. Michelle Rempel has dismissed the complaints, but the Information Commissioner has notified six government departments of her plan to investigate whether their scientists are really being censored. Julie Van Dusen, CBC News, Ottawa. Soma port lies just 30 kilometers north of the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant. Fishing resumed here last month following the lifting of a ban imposed after it was revealed in July that radioactive water had leaked into the ocean. As the fishermen prepared to cast their nets once again, the head of the local fishing cooperative offered his encouragement. Due to the problem of the contaminated water, I know you all have various concerns. By embarking on this trial fishing, we must show that the fisheries cooperative in Soma Futaba is willing to continue fishing. The fishermen are permitted to land 16 types of seafood. Around 95% of the catch is discarded. Many fishermen are concerned about the future of their livelihood. We are worried whether or not we can actually sell the fish. Opening a new session of Parliament this month, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe insisted the radiation leaks do not pose a threat to human health. The local fishermen are suffering from a bad reputation founded on falsehood. The effects on food and water are way below the limits for radiation levels. Just offshore from the Fukushima plant, scientists from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in the United States are working alongside Japanese counterparts monitoring radiation levels. Among them is Ken Buesela, who spoke to VOA via Skype. That radiation is moving across the Pacific, but it gets much, much lower, even short distances offshore. Buesela says a bigger concern is the accumulation of isotopes in marine life. Earlier this year, cesium isotopes from Fukushima were found in tuna caught off California. The tuna were caught off San Diego with the Fukushima cesium isotopes. They were 10 to 20 times lower than they had been off Japan. Now, the new releases, the leaks from the tanks, they're changing in character. Strontium-90 has become of more concern because it's a bone-seeking isotope. That will stay in fish much longer. TEPCO, the owner of the Fukushima plant, is building an underground frozen wall to prevent contaminated water from leaking into the sea. It is also experimenting with a system to decontaminate the water. A nuclear expert at the environmental organization Greenpeace, Rihanna Toole, says it's not clear those technologies will work. They already spend a lot of money trying to, to implement them. What uh, Greenpeace wants is that the government really gets in international advice and get as much support as possible to try and find the right solution for this problem. The livelihood of the fishermen of Fukushima depend on finding that solution. Henry Richwell for VOA News, Tokyo.
Complaints that federally funded scientists are muzzled by the current government aren't new, but now there's an effort to attach some hard facts to those claims, the kind of objective evidence that scientists like. Democracy Watch and the University of Victoria's Environmental Law Centre are asking the Information Commissioner of Canada to investigate. Calvin Sanborn is the Centre's legal director and joins us now. Hello there. Hi, Paul. Uh, First off, what are some uh, examples of uh, the government deliberately trying to restrict the flow of scientific information to the public? Well, in the last few years, uh, the situation has changed where government scientists used to be able to just speak to the media and then report to their superior that they've done it. But uh, there have been new federal policies brought in that say that uh, scientists are not free to do that, that they need to get approval. And there are policies in various departments that uh, require them to uh, deliver approved lines, quotes around approved lines. These responses they give have to be approved by the public relations people. Uh, And then there are specific policies at Environment Canada that say that if it's a climate change issue or an oil sands issue, that the scientist is forbidden from speaking unless they get approval right up to the Privy Council office has to give approval, and the minister has power over whether or not the scientist can speak. Um, There's an then, edict uh, that, that that suggests if it's specifically climate change related or tar sands related, that the Privy Council has to approve it? The Environment Canada's policy, which is found in our report, it states that, exactly. Wow. Yeah, so they're focusing in on climate change and oil sands, and, uh, and then um, the, the other thing that's ca- kind of striking is we have a case where there's a scientist that uh, uh, was asked a question by the media, and the response was written up by the public relations people and went to the assistant deputy minister for approval. And the, uh, an email was sent to the scientist saying that your, your statements, as attached, are uh, being in front of the assistant deputy minister for approval at this point. And the scientist said, those are not my statements. Like, they were actually ascribing quotes to the scientist without even letting him know. So there, there's a, there are a lot of explosive uh, examples in our report. And how is the work of the scientists being affected as a result, do you think? Well, I think scientists are very frustrated. Um, one of the direct results recently in the last week is that uh, the government is now saying that uh, international scientists must sign an agreement that gives the federal government the opportunity to veto whether or not the scientific research can be published in a scientific journal. And that has enormous implications. It means that government scientists in Canada may not be able to collaborate with scientists because American scientists are saying, we're not going to do that. We're not going to give the government of Canada a veto over whether or not our scientific research is published in Nature or Science magazine. So if one of our scientists is on a a joint international team... Uh, that's right. The rest of the team also has to comply. That's right. They're, that's what they're they're demanding that they that they sign an agreement. And the the Americans are facing a policy that is 180 degrees different.